Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone. We're gonna start the fifth edition of The Dig. I can't believe it's been five Wednesday evenings. Um, we have some regulars, which is great, who purchased the whole series. And the beautiful thing is there are regulars and then with every new session, um, everyone brings their own audiences. And it's fun just to see how everyone you know, kind of um, checks in after we've all been in our pandemic caves for the past 15 plus some months. But uh, that was one of the motivations for this whole program was there are really two things that we can do to build community. And that is to break bread and to tell stories. And um, as I've said, I've only been in Puebla for 10 years, but the stories just keep coming and coming and coming. And so the other thing that was really important is, you know, if you don't tell the stories, then they really never happened in many cases. And so this is 15 weeks where we get to share some of Pueblo's greatest stories. And I can tell you already, because we broadcast live, last week I got two calls from Arkansas, one from Mississippi, two from New Jersey, uh, five from Nebraska, uh, about four or five from Oklahoma. And these are all previous residents, many who come back to Pueblo because either they own property or they have family here. And so it was really fun to hear their stories. And many of them are now trying to come out and visit before we finish up on October 6th. But it looks like we may have one extra special edition following that. Um, the Senate bar, first of all, we have to give a big shout out to them because the whole family has been great. But we may do a very special edition, the 16th Wednesday on the Senate bar and really dig into some of the amazing stories because the speakeasy that actually exists here downstairs is pretty extraordinary. Um, but some of the stories that need to be told can only be told by several of the previous owners, and also by others who have been here for decades. And so um, I also want to give a shout out, as I do each week, the other thing, uh, for those of you that got to see the Rocky Mountain PBS documentary, uh, Justin Brager, um, he is leading the crew every Wednesday to film this not only live, but then we're archiving it. And two Wednesdays ago, we are just now starting a pilot program with Central High School with the 11th grade English department. And we're doing a whole special program on public speaking, on rhetoric, on satire, on sarcasm, uh, because a lot of the presenters have done some incredible jobs with that storytelling. So. Hands up to um, Justin and Jeff who are here today. And if you haven't seen the documentary yet, I highly encourage it um, because uh, it was about eight months in the making, but it really does capture more than just the flood. It's what happened before the flood, during the flood, and after the flood. And there's a lot of spoiler alerts, so I won't say anything more about it. You've got to watch it. But I'm really honored and pleased to have uh, Maria Sanchez Tucker here this evening, um, and I owe a lot of my passion and my drive to learn about Pueblo from Maria, who every, we even had a standing date there for a while in our calendars, uh, because Maria was part of the special collections and the genealogy department, which is on the third floor of the main Rawlings Library, and I would make a beeline to that particular floor literally, I mean, for several years, it was consistent. And if I didn't know where to find the information, Maria knew where to at least go, and then we would both dig in and we would find more and more information. And John Korber, if you're not familiar with John Korber and the John Korber files, um, here's a gentleman that, like a CSI investigator, literally dials into every single little detail and puts together these scrapbooks. And we have about, are there about 200 of these binders? I mean, something like that, something amazing. One of the things that I would like to do is digitize those and make those available because he has saved us just hours and days and weeks, months of, of hard work. He's really done an extraordinary job. But um, I want to introduce Maria, and I'm going to pull up because you have so many things that you've done. Oh, you don't have to say all yes, that. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, 
But Maria Sanchez Tucker is the director of the Santa Fe Public Library in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> she is the former manager of the Special Collections and Museum Services Department of the Pueblo City County Library District and the first executive director of the Bessemer Historical Society and the Steelworks Museum. She received a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from the University of New Mexico, a Master of Arts in Museum Science from Texas Tech University, and a Master of Library and Information Science from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Maria has been in the library, museum, and nonprofit field for over 20 years, working with a variety of cultural institutions and collections. She believes that the public library is the center of the community, supporting lifelong learning and literacy, and fostering creativity and innovation in a community. And I can't say anything more other than once a year, I do a campaign which is hug a librarian. <laughs> Because truly, librarians are really our social entrepreneurs. I mean, they're the ones that get in, dive in. They help you navigate the information. So kudos to Maria. And I do not know a lot about Andrew McClelland other than some really wild and crazy things. So I'm really excited <laughs> to be able to sit back and listen tonight. So the floor is yours, Maria. Great. Thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see so many new faces and so many good friends um, to come back and see me tonight. I'm really um, excited to be back in Pueblo, um, my hometown. I love Pueblo so much. Um, I'm really excited to share with you the story of Andrew McClelland. Um, how many of you feel like you know a lot about Andrew McClelland? No? OK, well then this will all be good and new to you. <laughs> I lost my, I lost my uh, microphone, of course. Um, so I put this pro program together a few years ago. And um, as Gregory was talking about, the special collections at the Rawlings Library is an amazing treasure trove of historical information. But one of the things the um, collection holds is an archival collection of letters sent to Pueblo from Andrew McClellan, handwritten letters. And um, knowing that the library had been named the McClellan Library, I became very interested in looking at these letters. And so as I started looking through his letters, I just found that this man was very fascinating. Not only did he leave a legacy in Pueblo, but his story and the story that surrounds him is really fascinating. So hang tight with me. There's a little bit of boring history stuff in the middle, but then we're going to get to scandal and intrigue, a little bit of sex, and of course, librarians, which <laughs> that's my favorite thing. So, um, so hang tight. So um, Andrew McClellan was born in December of 1850 in Grundy County, Missouri. McClellan had a modest upbringing and grew up on his father's farm. His first job was a school teacher. But after a few years, he found that wasn't his calling. He then moved to Denver in 1872 and worked as a carpenter in Georgetown. In 1874, he went into a partnership in a flour and grain business in Georgetown until 1881. He married Columbia Jane Gray from Iowa in Castle Rock in 1877. We'll learn more about Columbia later in the presentation, and she is so interesting and could be a full presentation herself. Hopefully, does, uh, hopefully somebody does more research on her. Um, in 1881, he sold his share of business, and he and, McClellan, he and Columbia traveled for six months out east. And in 1882, after researching a good place to start a grain and flour business, he settled on Pueblo, as it had a growing population and was a promising place to start a business. So uh, McClellan was a shrewd businessman and a smart investor. And the McClellan Mercantile operated in Pueblo for 97 years and closed in 1969. Um, in 1907, the McClellan Mercantile celebrated their 25-year anniversary with a celebration at their new warehouse, where he and the workers greeted their guests in work attire. An article in the Pueblo Chieftain describing the celebration quotes, McClellan is saying, during this entire time, I have not seen the failure of a single man who has invested their money in Pueblo. 
I believe that local conditions are better now than ever before, and I shall continue to show evidence of my confidence by continuing to invest. So here is a photo of, oops, I keep losing this. Um, here is a photo of the uh, Mercantile, the original building, and it's still standing. It's used by the city of Pueblo. What, Wade, what is it used as? Purchasing. That's the city of Pueblo purchasing building, so it's still there. It's on um, C and Mechanic Streets. Yeah. So you can drive by and, and see that. It's really um, quite interesting. So McClelland was a Pueblo pioneer, and he was civically engaged, and he was elected as president of the Board of, Tr of Trade in 1891 and he had the Board of Trade building built. Um, he invested in real estate and he became a leader of the movement to secure the right of way for the Missouri Pacific Railroad. And also in 1891, the M McClellan Free Public Library opened and operated out of the Board of Trade building. And this is an image of the letterhead from his company that is in that archival collection I spoke about. Um, from 1891 to 1904, McClellan oversaw his business, the Board of Trade, and the library. So um, this quote right here, the philanthropist, um, he, in the name of the people of Pueblo, I dedicate this stone to the boys and girls of Pueblo in the hope that it may stand till men shall know war no more and each man is a brother. I was going to try to have my husband do these quotes in this like very deep <laughs> voice kind of, but unfortunately you'll just have to hear my voice. <laughs> So in 1893, the city of Pueblo approved and appropriated funds to support a public library. And because of his support and donations to the library, McClelland was also a designated member of the Library Board of Trustees for and during the remainder of his natural life um, through this ordinance. Can you imagine appointing a board member, for those of you who work in nonprofits, a board member for their natural life through an ordinance? Um, so in 1893, the library had a debt of $500, and 204 of that was library salaries. I can tell you things have not changed that much. <laughs> and in 1901, several citizens began a fundraising campaign to build a new public library. Andrew Carnegie provided $60,000 in funding for the public library, and McClellan donated funds and the land where the new library was to be built. In 1904, the magnificent McClellan Library opened to the public. And here was a picture of the original library. How many of you remember going in there? There's a lot of people who have memories of the beautiful library building. Um, and then this is an advertisement, and it said that the hours of the library from, were daily from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. When I was working there, I did not want that word to get out, but that's how many. Um, and it says that every streetcar passes the building. So the McClellans never had any children, and as the years passed, Mrs. McClellan began to dream of having a home for homeless children. And in 1906, McClellan purchased a building and property and donated it to the Protestant Orphanage Committee. The building and large grounds became the McClellan Children's Home, and Mrs. McClellan continued to support the orphanage throughout her life. According to her, obit her obituary, Andrew McClellan often told friends that the first suggestion for the orphanage came from his wife, and he regarded it as her home for children. They continued to make substantial contributions to both the library and the orphanage. So, um, this is also, um, he had his own letterhead, and it says, Andrew McClellan, the world is my country, wherever I am is home. I'm from Missouri, show me. <laughs> um, but he became a world traveler. And in 1904, McClellan handed the business operations to a trusted business associate, Joseph Sprengel, and he embarked on the first of his world tours. He traveled the world in 1904 and again in 1909. He visited Europe, Egypt, Java, China, Japan, Hawaii, New Guinea, New Zealand, Australia, Africa, and New Zealand. And his travels were documented through articles. Well, we'll just see. 
His travels were documented through articles that he sent to the Pueblo of Houston, and these detailed letters included many pictures and information about the places he visited and the people and cultures he observed while traveling. He wanted his inf this information to be shared with all of his friends. An article in the Pueblo Chieftain announcing his second world tour stated that he did not know when he would come home, how long he would be gone, but he expects that he will wander until he becomes homesick and return to Pueblo. And as McClellan traveled, he purchased artifacts and objects to send back to share with the pe people of Pueblo to display in a museum located in the library. And this image shows a portrait of Andrew McClelland and an exhibit of some of the collection that is currently at the Rosemont Museum in Pueblo. The Pueblo Library has a portrait in their art collection of Mrs. McClelland, and I believe these were commissioned and painted at the same time. I also feel like this didn't really look like him, so I, I'm not really sure, but I think he probably made himself look really good. <laughs> The mummies, so I think this, that's probably the most famous thing that he's known for is uh, three mummies from Egypt were sent back to Pueblo as part of the collection. Two of the mummies are on exhibit at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. They're currently there. And the third mummy, the McClellan's most prized artifact, Lady Asset Becca, has been on exhibit at the Rosemount Museum in Pueblo since 1968. So this image shows the interior of the library and one of the Chinese vases from the collection can be seen. And there's this great oral history that provides information about, um, about the library. And it was written by a Miss Rebecca Emery Morton and she recounts stories of the McClellan Library from 1921 to 1937 where she worked as a library employee. She recounted the following description of the museum. It was a large room in the central area housed the museum. This was a magnet for the children of the city who came in flocks on Tuesday and announced to the person at the charging desk, I want to see the mummies. <laughs> there were three of them spirited out of Egypt at considerable cost by Mr. McClellan in the days before the Egyptians decided to keep such treasures at home. The mummy cases were so long that they could not be moved, maneuvered around the turn of the stairs, so a window had to be taken out, and they, they were hauled up by block and tackle. Mr. Chapman, the librarian at the time, Mr. Springle, and another member of the library bo board supervised, and Miss Strang, who was then assistant librarian, hovered around to watch and help. The wrappings around the mummy were dingy in the extreme, and the men, fearful of foreign germs, made frequent trips to the window to clear their throats and expectorate. But Miss Strang, being a lady, could not take that precaution. <laughs> no one came down with any dreaded diseases, however. According to Emery Morton, McClellan also brought gifts back to library employees, and he gave her a string of Baroque Jordan pearls, interspersed with the bright blue Turkish beads, and another time an ivory miniature of the Pearl Mosque at Agra. The original um, McClellan Library was replaced with a new building in 1965, and there was no room for the collection, so the collection was donated to the city and became part of the Metropolitan Museum. Now the Rosemont Museum is the steward of the collection. But I never received any gifts like that, like when I was a librarian. <laughs> um, so here's another picture of the beautiful interior of the library, and of course, that could have been Rebecca Emery Morton. I don't think it was, but we don't know what she looked like. Um, so upon his return to Pueblo from his 1909 expedition, Andrew McClellan went into the publishing business and started the Pueblo Leader. Um, the inaugural edition was published on June 3rd 1911, and McClellan stated in this inaugural edition, I have entered into this service with great reluctance, and only after I have become convinced that Pueblo needs a means of publicity which shall absolutely be free of influence and any self-seeking class or interest or party or organization or creed or church or individual. And he goes on to state that the leader will be an in independent in politics, in its treatment in every public question, independent in its activities for greater social and economic justice. 
and the leader was published from 1911 to 1913. And if you're interested, the microfilm is at the Special Collections and you can read um, the Andrew McClelland newspaper. So this takes us to the events of 1911. Um, so the events of 1911 were quite complex and due to time constraints of this presentation, I'm only able to provide a very brief overview of these events. Um, but it's no coincidence that the Pueblo leader began publication in 1911 and then on June 1st, 1911, Pueblo had voted in a historic election to change their form of city government. Does that sound familiar? Under the charter, the people would elect five commissioners and three members of a civil service, commissioned under the preferential system, and most importantly, they were subject to recall. Um, this election was divisive, and it was clear that people wanted this change in government, and some felt that career politicians were running the city. This image from October 1911 shows a political cartoon uh, prior to the election of the commissioners and makes a strong statement about perpetual office holders, grafters, politicians versus on honest and competent men. Hmm, does that just sound the same as today? <laughs> Our political climate? And here's the ballot from 1911. It had 84 candidates, over 55 running for the five city commissioners. And McClellan was a big proponent of the charter government, government and praised it as a necessary change. So recently, Pueblo voted to change to a strong mayor sister, system of government. Um, but I think 1911 was a, a lot more interesting. So articles within the leader began accusing members of the city government from profiting from prostitution in the red light district. This quote, human nature is human nature, of course, and men and women will always sin, but that is one thing. And organized traffic in women participated in by the city is another, and the latter can and must be stopped. Because of these controversial and serious accusations, City Council and specifically Alderman Norbert Zink accepted the thankless task as a result they started an investigation, he stated, and found open and flagrant immorality and unmistakable prostitution within a district of the city. And we found that women are confined there by order of the city authorities and they are being grossly exploited and mulleted and made to pay exorbitant rentals and fees and charges. The investigation accused Alderman Zink as specifically involved. So um, it's really interesting to see that the city, you know, was confining these women to a certain area of town and then charging them rents and fees. Um, so as a result of this report and investigation, Alderman Zink introduced an ordinance to remove McClellan from the McClellan Library Board of Tru Trustees and the name of the building. The Pueblo chieftain stated that Zinc lit the fuse to a bomb in city council chambers last night. He wanted to ensure that his full statement was not misinterpreted. He asked the clerk to read it into the record. And Zinc stated that McClellan is so devoid of moral character and given to licentiousness as to make him unfit to serve as a trustee of the McClellan Public Library. He also asked that a committee of five men investigate McClellan. He also stated he had evidence to prove that McClellan was immoral. And so somewhere out there could possibly be a letter that Andrew McClellan wrote to a woman. But um, I never found this actual letter, but that's what Alderman Zink um, was saying, that he had proof that Andrew McClellan was having an affair. So um, the oral history written by Rebecca Emery Morton recounts the story of Al Andrew McClellan and the removing of the name of Mr. McClellan. Ma he made, Mr. McClellan made numerous trips abroad, leaving his business as the Mel McClellan Mercantile Company to Mr. Springle. When he was planning his first trip, he asked his wife Columbia to go with him, but she declined foreign countries having no attraction for her. 
reliable rumor then had it that he had asked another lady who did go, and there was an exclamation mark after that. <laughs> Um, when word got around that Mr. M had a female traveling companion, some of the citizens in the more straight-laced days became so irate about it that a delegation appeared at the library with crowbars, threatening to pry out his name from the ceiling in the foyer. But that tall, frail aristocrat, Miss Strang, took her stand right on the letters and defied them until James could summon the police. Um, the tall aristocrat, Morton, was describing Miss Strang. Strang was the head librarian who worked for the library for over 30 years. Uh, so I was not able to ever verify this story in the story from the newspaper articles. I'm not sure if they really did march with crowbars to come take his name down, but they did put forth this ordinance to remove him. So um, there was that, that movement going on. Um, and McClellan wrote many letters to Miss Strang over the years, and some of these are still preserved in the archives. So I'm not sure that Ms. Strang held back an, a mob of angry men, but the story serves as a good metaphor of what di was documented in the newspaper. The women did come to his defense. So in an article from the Montrose Daily Press, it states, Zinc is willing to drop the matter, taking refuge behind the skirts of the Pueblo Club women. So on October 31st, the Pueblo chieftain stated, this is a quote, it was ladies' night at city council. <laughs> a large delegation of women representing the Federation of Women's Clubs were there to support McClellan. This is a quote from the newspaper article. There were young, beautiful women, the stately society dame, the prominent club women, and the professional women. <laughs> And then it goes on to say, even Andy's wife was there. <laughs> In volume four of the History of Colorado, Andrew McClellan is quote as, quoted as saying, I'm largely indebted to my wife for whatever financial success I have achieved. Columbia Jane came to McClellan's defense that night at what the Pueblo chieftain recounted as an exciting city council meeting on where she dramatically exclaimed, gentlemen, this is a public institution and the private affairs of my husband do not concern the people. It is none of their business. If we are such undesirable citizens and unfit for other people to live with, give us back our money and we will leave. <laughs> I think that said it all there, right? Um, So the women's groups, the library trustees, and the Monday Evening Club all provided their own ordinance in protest of the removal of the McClellan from the library. And the meeting was full of excitement, and the chieftain stated that the fair guests were treated to some genuine municipal warfare. <laughs> they got to see Alderman Zink and Councilman Donnelly come to near blows. The leader reported that Alderman Zink stated that women were no better than the men I have just been talking about. The leader also ran this ad that stated, if the ladies of the Pueblo would register as hard a kick with the grocers for good bread as they did last night with the council against changing the name of the library, it would mean Sunville products universally. And I just thought that was so funny that the bread company got involved in it. Um, so. And then you can see right here, um, I love this. Dramatic scenes are enacted at an exciting meeting of council. Andrew McClellan gains floor and wildly attacks almost everybody before being silenced. <laughs> so on November 7, 1911, the chieftain um, stated that last night's city council meeting would go down in history as the most dramatic ever held at the old city hall. Andrew McClellan vilified Mayor West and city clerk Frank Duke and asked the people to not vote for those two in the next day's election. Mayor West replied in vehement language to the attack when he sat down, tears were flowing down his cheeks. Later, McClellan went over and asked the mayor's pardon. Alderman Gill brought in the little white dove of peace and turned it loose in the council chamber by asking the regular order of business be suspended and that the ordinances regarding McClellan be considered. Both ordinances were not passed and indefinitely pigeonholed. So I always wonder about that little white dove of peace. <laughs> <laughs> so in 
so Andrew McClellan left Pueblo in the next few years after his, this situation occurred to live near his family in Long Beach, California. He disposed of his wealth prior to his death and distributed it to his 35 nieces and nephews and donations to the library and the orphanage. And I believe he still traveled as I found his passport renewal when he was 73 years old. And he also continued to write letters to Pueblo trustees and served as the president of the library from California. Um, and Columbia lived the rest of her life in, a, in Pueblo in a small brick apartment just around the corner. Um, her obituary states that she was known as a shrewd investor. Despite her wealth, she wore clothes of pre-war vintage and had few modern luxuries. She died in 1939, three years after McClellan. So um, this is a letter that he wrote from his hospital room. Uh, so I became more intrigued with Andrew. I think one day I'm going to go to Pasadena and look in their archives and see what else I can find out about him. But um, I looked and I found him in the census after he moved to California. And in the 1920s census, there was a Walter Howard who was 56, a Margaret Howard who was 57, Andrew McClellan who was 69, and a Betsy Faulkner, 38. We don't know who Betsy Faulkner was, but... I'm assuming it was his traveling companion, um, or a nurse or somebody staying with him, but those who lived in the household. And then the 1930 census had um, Walter Howard, Margaret, a William Hare and a Harold Hare, Andrew McClone, who was 79 at the time, and a woman named Maddie Snyder, who was 68. And um, I was trying to do a little bit more research, but I think Maddie Snyder was actually from Pueblo, so there's some connection there. And so I thought, well, who, who did he live with? And who were these, um, the Howards? But they were Asian art collectors. So he um, had friends that lived in California. And of course, he probably still continued to look for art and collect art. Um, and so that's who he lived with. And there's a Howard and Asian art collection still to this day in California. So um, Andrew McClellan died on March 21st, 1936, and at McClellan's request, no religious service was held over his body. An article in the Pueblo Chieftain stated that his belief expressed frequently was, I believe there is a God that will take care of me as well in death as he has in life. Um, although others stated that he was an atheist. So I just think it's very interesting because I'm going to read you his letter and what he actually did say about his death and about God. Um, but the Pueblo chieftain kind of paraphrased it a little bit. So here, here's what, um, what his letter said to the Library Board of Trustees concerning his burial wishes. My body will be cremated and my ashes mailed to you. You will confer with the trustees of the McClellan Children's Home. It is my wish that the ashes remain in the library for 90 days, and during that time, if any of my relatives, friends, or enemies want a part of them, you with home trustees give one half of them to those who ask for them, and the other half you divide equally with trustees and director, trustees of the home, and they to be scattered on the lawns of the library and the home. If you, trustee and director, want to have any ceremonies, you may, but it is my wish that they not be of a religious nature, for I believe that Christian religion, as all others, mostly superstition and harmful, to teach them they must suffer as a result of their sins, and their happiness is a consequence, consequence of right things, right acting, and right living. If you decide on any kind of ceremony, it is my wish that one friend or enemy may have 10 minutes to say each, but no longer, and I have done what I've done for the people of Pueblo because it made me happy. I'm facing death unafraid, believing that if there be another life of consciousness, I will have as good opportunities there as have had here and have found this a good world. So his body lay in state in March 22nd. Um, and that's his letter right there. His body lay in state in March 22nd in a Pasadena mortuary and hundreds paid their last respects many among former, or many from Pueblo as well. And he and Columbia are buried at the Roselawn Cemetery in Pueblo. And 
Um, the Riverside building, he had that building built just across the street and the McClellan School and the Rawlings Public Library, which was renamed Rawlings after another um, prominent Puebloan. Um, so uh, he had a great um, impact on Pueblo and was a very important person. I feel like he uh, has not received the recognition that he deserves. And I also think it's interesting how we have sort of these myths about what he did and why he did it. But um, so his letters and his words actually bring some of his true uh, history to life. So I really have a lot of respect for Andrew McClelland. I didn't get to meet him, but um, I feel like I know him after reading his words and, and looking into this history. So with that, I am available for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Are there any questions? Good job. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions uh, from some people sitting back here. First of all, the McClellan Library, does it still stand, and if so, where? It was torn down, and um, it was near the location where um, there's a little park outside the Rawlings Library. It was there. Okay. And, and there are still, if you go in front of the Rawlings Libraries, there's some, what are those called? The cornerstone, the, um, the little cornice or some, some pieces of the building are still there in the, in the courtyard at the Rawlings Library. Okay, thank you. The, um, the children's home, was that his home or that was built to be a home for children? It was an orphanage and it was a home for children and so they, they supported it, they funded it. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering, there's an, there is an orphanage here. Is that the same as the one you're talking about? Or is the red building that is the school, is, was that the that orphanage? That was the orphanage. That was the home, the so, McClellan okay. home. Now it's the McClellan school. Okay. Um, and there, there were a couple of other orphanages, the Sacred Heart Orphanage and yes. then the Martin Luther King, um, where the Martin Luther King building mm -hmm. was. Um, they were all sort of segregated. Gotcha. Thank you. And that's a whole other story. The orphanages of right, Pueblo is right. an amazing story, which we have some people that are interested in doing that in the next season of The Dig. Any other questions? Oh, there's one over Rebecca. here. Rebecca. Hi, Maria. Hi. Um, so is it true that the nonfiction section of the Rawlings Library on the second floor is still part of the original McClellan Library? Yes. So there's a delineation, and you can see where, uh, well, there was a second iteration. So there was the first McClellan Library, then there was a 1968 library building, so oh, that's okay. what you would be seeing. But the other building was, com the first building was completely torn down. Okay, thank you. You mentioned that he was, uh that he had traveled abroad in different areas, specifically Europe. Have you found any uh, records from uh, countries other than the United States? Or have um, you looked? Just, well, he would write back to the Pueblo Chieftain and document all his um, travels. So it was kind of interesting. I think that his travels to many different, um, to me it seemed like his, his, um, his thoughts and his idea about justice and giving and philanthropy had a lot to do with seeing so many different cultures in the world. Um, I think that impacted him. So you'll see, like he went to Germany, he'll write about that, but those are all in the Pueblo Chieftain newspapers and you can read those. Well, I was gonna say that the countries themselves might actually have records. You know, they might, yeah. So it, it, would, be, it would be really fascinating to find uh, records from Germany or e Egypt at the time. Yeah. It would be absolutely fascinating because I know Egypt was under, under British rule. There's probably a whole lot more out there. This is just probably touching the surface. So I, I yeah. think it would be really fascinating to look at other archives as well. I think you may just have defined your whole undergraduate and graduate career right there. <laughs> Hi, Maria. Hi. This is just kind of a, a sideways question, but what's an alderman? It was like a city councilman. 
Yeah, so there were the city councilmen and aldermen, or Looks they like were they had just like commissioners and aldermen. So it must have been like before we had the county commissioners and the city council. Ah, uh, okay, so thanks. Don't aldermen represent the district? Oh, yeah, maybe like the city council. Like I guess somebody who, like they represent a district. Do you know more, Wade? That's right. So are they like city council? Yeah, they were they were city council. Does so, anybody know who the most famous um, resident of the McClellan home was? As an orphan? Dan Rowan. No, Dan Rowan. <laughs> Maria, do you know where they lived when they lived here together? Or did they have a big fancy house or? Um, they never had a fancy house. He lived in the Riverside building and she had a little place and I don't think they really lived together. They weren't into um, fancy things, which is kind of interesting to me. And I think, you know, he left and traveled so much that he probably didn't feel he needed a big fancy house. My question is a follow-up to what you just said is she ended up not living with him towards the end of his life. The census doesn't show her in California. She, she stayed, stayed in here Pueblo. in Pueblo. I think they had um, they had an agreement. They had she was happy here in Pueblo, living her life, and he left. I feel like he felt very um, pushed out and offended by what took place. How people couldn't see what he did for Pueblo, and they did, they did this to him. So he he left and. Um, I'm sure they communicated often, and I'm sure that they, you know, they gave their money away before, so they didn't really live uh, rich lives after. They probably just had enough to live on. And they, they're still uh, McClellan, um, there was an aunt, I never spoke with her, but she lived in Denver. I don't know if she's passed away, but she was probably in her 90s. Um, but he, they had a lot of nieces and nephews, and so there were still relatives. And with that, I think it's a big thank you to Maria for coming all the way from Santa Fe to share. And I'm really excited because next week, um, there's been an ongoing kind of um, wonderful discussion about mid-century modern and, and that aesthetic. And there's been the Pueblo Modern shows. We've had historical neighborhood context done. And Wade Broadhead, who is here in the front, and Bree Pappen, who is also from the Pueblo Library, they're going to be leading next week's presentation. And then we're actually going to be launching the Pueblo Modern website, which is an amazing website. And it also gives people an opportunity who trade and sell in vintage mid-century modern clothing and artifacts. There's going to be an e-commerce section for that. So um, that's going to be fun next week. So. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week.